Hello everybody and welcome to module 10, question 2a. So now we've moved on to the next category of tests and this progression is entirely the same as what we saw in module 9. Went from the Z tests where we knew the population standard deviation, and then we go into the T test where we no longer know the population standard deviation. And the, the consequence in module 10 with two populations is very, very similar to the consequence that we saw in module nine. Now we have to deal with degrees of freedom because now we're estimating those population standard deviations with the sample standard deviations. So that brings us from the Z distribution to now using the T distribution. Now, with two populations, there's one more little complication. And that's whether or not we have reason to believe that the population standard deviations are equal or not. In, in all instances, we don't know what it is. We're estimating them. But what I'm talking about here is whether or not we have reason to believe that the population standard deviations, we don't know them, but do we have reason to believe that they're equal or reason to believe that they are unequal? And so depending on what assumption we make about the population standard deviation, that is going to affect how we calculate the degrees of freedom. It's either quite straightforward or it's exceedingly complicated. I'm going to focus my practice problems on the one that is a little bit more straightforward only because when we assume that we do not know what the population, or sorry, when we assume that we, um, that the population standard deviations are not equal, the resulting calculation is nothing more than complicated and tedious and time consuming. And I don't want to spend time, I don't want to bore people with this tedious calculation. So I'll do one example of that at the end of this section. But for the most part, we're going to assume Again, we don't know what sigma is, but we are going to make a simplifying assumption that they are equal. Whatever they are, they are equal. And that's going to make our calculations just a little bit simpler to work with. Okay, so let's go through here and then we'll talk about these issues as they arise. A friend once told you that golden retrievers are a much faster breed of dog than a border collie. As a dog lover, you become interested in determining whether or not the data would support such a claim. So you managed to gather 29 golden retrievers, and here I'm going to start to highlight important bits of information. 29 golden retrievers, 31 border collies for a 100 meter dog race. After the race, I gather all their times. You find the average time for the golden retriever is 72 seconds for the border collie it was 88.1 seconds. We have our sample standard deviations, 183 and 157. So again, I can, I can determine by looking at the problem that this is a test on two populations because my problem is describing for me two samples. I know that it's going to be a t-test because of course it's telling me that we're working with the sample standard deviations and the notation here also reflects a sample standard deviation. Now, what kind of test am I doing? Well, what is it we're trying to do? Uh, we want to formulate a test to evaluate our friend's claim. Our friend's claim is that golden retrievers are faster than border collies. Okay, so we have all of the little ingredients for our test. Now, this is where it's important for us to think about the units of measurement of our data. Because if I define my terms, and again, we've all gone through the, the discussion about how we can switch our terms and the way we define our terms determines whether we're doing an upper tail or lower tail test. I've talked about that a few times. So for this problem, I'm just going to define my terms the way that they appear in the problem, just for simplicity. So I'm going to say, okay, my golden retriever is going to be population one and the border collie will be population two. Now, when I think faster, right, because we're, we're putting together a test to see if they are a faster breed of dog. 
I know that it's a common way of thinking when we're thinking about something that is faster, we're thinking it about speed. And so a, a greater speed, a higher speed is faster. And so you might be inclined to do something like this, which of course I can rewrite this to say the average thinking speed for a golden retriever is greater than the average speed for a border collie. And that's a really common mistake. I've seen that mistake made uh, a few times when I've used these problems elsewhere because you're thinking about speed. But look at what the data is. The data here is in seconds. It's in time. The amount of time it took to run a fixed distance. So a faster dog is not one that has a higher time, but it's one that has a lower time. So I would write this like that. That's a lower tail test. We formulate the test this way so that if the evidence supports the null hypotheses, the golden retriever is taking at least as much time, if not more, right? At least as much time to complete that race as the border collie. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, now I have evidence that supports my friend's claim that they are in fact a faster breed of dog because they're taking less time to run that race. So I have this set up as a lower tail test. Now we want to calculate our test statistics. So here's where some of the differences are going to come up as a result of this assumption. We would typically go through our test statistic and think, okay, this is x bar 1, x bar 2, and that hypothesized difference. And then we divide that by the standard error. And so typically we might think uh, it's something like this. If we're assuming that those standard deviations are equal, then this would be the incorrect standard error. That would be a standard error that reflects two different um, population variances. If we're assuming they're equal, then what we need is something called a pooled estimator of that um, of that common variance. If it's if they have the same population variance, then I need an estimate of that common population variance, right? If sigma one equals sigma two well then I can eliminate that subscript and that just equals some common population variance. So I need an estimate of that common population variance. Well, that estimate comes in the form of what is called a pooled estimator, which looks something like this, divided by N1 plus N2 minus two. So this gives me what is called our pool estimator of that common population variance. And it also means that my degrees of freedom is simply n1 plus n2 minus 2. So let's calculate that pooled estimator first before we go ahead and calculate our test statistic because it's going to change the denominator of our test statistic. Uh, just a little bit. So our sample sizes, I have 29 for the golden retriever, 1.83 squared, and I had 31 of the border collie, and that was 1.57 squared, divided by 29 plus 31 minus 2. So what is that going to give me? Plus 30 times 1.57 squared divided by 29, 31 minus 2. So that gives me a pooled estimator of 2.892. I'll keep it to three decimal places just to maintain a little bit of accuracy. I don't want to cause any issues with rounding. 
keep my rounding error to a minimum here. So what does that mean for our standard error? Let me just go like this. Because now what I have is this pooled estimator for that numerator. This is now sp squared, sp squared. And so that's where this value is going to come in. So this is sometimes rewritten with that sample variance factored out. Um, but for us, we can just leave it like this. So now it's relatively the same as other t-tests that we've done, other two population t-tests. So now I have my sample means, my, there we go, my 7.2, I lost my thoughts, 7.2, 8.1. Our hypothesized difference here is just zero, divided by the square root of uh, our pooled estimator, so 2892 over that sample size 29 over that sample size 31. And so you can see how we could factor out that 2.892 uh, if we wanted to. Here we go, 7.2 minus 8.1 divided by 2.892 over 29 and over 31. That gives me my test statistic of negative 2.05. Good. Now, just like any other t-test, same process, right? Again, so much of what we do in hypothesis testing is so similar. But you can see when we have these small little differences, well, here's a little difference. I have to calculate this pooled estimator, and now that's changed my degrees of freedom. But the process is the same. I have my test statistic, 2.05. My degrees of freedom, here I have 58 degrees of freedom. I come down to my T tables. And 58, well, the closest that I have here is 60. And my test statistic of 2.05, well, here I'm kind of in the, between these guys, right? And so my probability of interest, well, those are very close together, between 0.025 and 0.02. And here, this is a one-tail test. So that's my p-value. My p-value is less than 0.025, greater than 0.02. So we've got our p-value. Draw our conclusion based on the p-value. Well, if our level of significance here is alpha 0.05, I can quite comfortably reject because if our p-value is less than 0.025, I know it's also less than 0.05. So we can comfortably reject based on that p-value approach. If we're using the critical value approach, again, 58 degrees of freedom. Remember when we're using the t-distribution, most of this table is irrelevant, right? When we're using the t-distribution, we just find that one row of critical values and we ignore all the rest, right? Because only that one row is relevant. So I need that one row of critical values and always that row of corresponding probabilities. So if for our critical value, we're doing this test at the 05 level of significance. So I'm coming down down, 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 and there's our critical value, 1.67. So our critical T at 0.05, I'm, I'll say 60 degrees of freedom because technically that is what we're using only because I lack the detail in my table 
to have 58 degrees of freedom. And so here we had that critical value, it's already slipped my mind, 1.67. And more specifically, it's a lower tail test, so that would be negative 1.67. And once more, we see this graphically, there's that 1.67 where I'm going to reject. That's an area here of 0.05. My test statistic is negative 2. And of course, that area there is my p value, which is less than, well, it's less than 0.025, so absolutely it's less than 0 0.05. And so that gives us the same conclusion. In both of these cases, we reject the null hypotheses. What does that mean? Coming back up here, well, that means that I actually have evidence to support my friend's claim. That on average, golden retrievers are completing that 100 meter dog race in less time than the border collies, which is consistent with saying they're faster on average than those border collies. Okay. Good, so we'll do a couple more examples like this, just so you get a bit of a feel for it. And then, well, as always, we'll keep moving on. Hope this was helpful, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.